Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel or welcome to my channel. I'm Bird's Eye View Politics and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the new United Kingdom political crisis. Now just a few weeks ago Italy had yet another round of elections after yet another government collapse. Israel is set to do the same in just a few weeks and it looks like the United Kingdom could be headed towards the same path and they already have been at least since Boris Johnson resigned. But I think it's worth looking back towards when Boris resigned and to see how the Conservative Party got to where they were then to where they are now. So this is the timeline from Boris to blank and I've deliberately left blank as five letters which I'll get to in this video. So first up we had the resignation of Boris Johnson. Now Boris Johnson resigning but not usually uh, I guess something that wasn't seen beforehand. Many people had expected him to resign, and he did indeed resign after winning a no confidence vote within his own party. A no confidence vote is where a party and the members of parliament from that party in the United Kingdom, in this case the Conservative Party, get to vote to decide whether to oust their leader and stop them being the leader of the Conservative Party, which would also mean that they would stop being prime minister. Boris Johnson actually won his confidence vote, but rarely does a prime minister win a confidence vote and survive more than a few months. Theresa May, of course, lost her con or won her confidence vote and then lost her own spot as the prime minister soon after due to being forced to resign due to increasing pressure. Boris Johnson had a similar experience, and this triggered a leadership election, and so there was many candidates from many different wings of the party, so I'm just going to put them all here, or the main ones at least. If the name does not have parentheses, it means they were officially a candidate, and if they were parentheses, then that means that they were a likely endorser or an influential part of that wing of the party. The Conservative Party currently contains three major wings. The Conservative Liberals of the Left, like led by Rishi Sunak, you had the center of the party, your compromised candidates, the normal conservatives like Penny Mordaunt, and you had the right of the party, which were economic libertarians and socially very conservative, led by Liz Truss. In this election, there was also some major endorsements made by candidates or potential candidates who could have run, such as Ben Wallace or Nigel Farage, Jacob Rees-Mogg, even Boris Johnson himself likely behind the scenes pushed for a loss from first Mordaunt and later for Sunak, which led to his eventual support of trust. It's also worth noting that the media, at least on the right of the political spectrum in the United Kingdom, is on the right of the Conservative Party itself. Only one major news organization, The Times, endorsed either the center or the left. The Times, of course, induced Rishi Sunak. Meanwhile, on the right, the Daily Express, the Daily Telegraph, and of course the Daily Mail all endorsed the most right-wing candidates. At first, it seemed that we were likely to have a Sunak versus Mordaunt battle in the final two candidates, and this is what I predicted way back when we first started out. However, Truss quickly consolidated the support of the right, despite not being expected to, especially after the first few rounds of voting, which led to endorsements from influential candidates such as Ben Wallace, Jacob Rees-Mogg, and other defeated candidates like Kemi Badenoch and Sua Bravman. This led to a victory for Truss and the right. However, there was a significant divide between the members of parliament and the members of the conservative party. Most members of parliament are centrists or left-wingers in the party, although not all of them, which meant that most of them preferred Sunak over Truss. However, most of the members preferred just a general right-winger, and if we look back here, you can see that Truss was at the top of that list. She was the most influential of the right of the party, and so while most members may have preferred someone like Badenoch or Suha Braverman, Truss ended up being in the final two from that side of the party, therefore Truss was likely going to win the members vote. And that is what happened, Truss was able to win the members vote, despite most members of parliament backing Sunak. So, on September 23rd, the new government, led by Truss, 
had a chancellor named Quasi Quarteng, who proposed massive tax cuts on the rich, among other things, on September 23rd. Markets went into total downfall mode, where the pound collapsed, inflation rapidly increased, the Bank of England had to take numerous measures to save pension funds, which led to the eventual fall of Quasi Quarteng being forced to resign on the 14th of October. This led to the appointment of Jeremy Hunt, which is pretty important because if we look at what faction of the party Jeremy Hunt was from, he's on the left of the party. He was in favor of the austerity measures under David Cameron way back in the 2010s, and Jeremy Hunt has always been on the left or center of the party, being the main opponent of Boris Johnson back when Boris Johnson was running for the prime minister in his own right. So this was clearly a major shift in policy by Liz Truss. But it didn't just end there, because Jeremy Hunt reversed almost the entirety of Liz Truss's policy, which led, by the 17th of October, just three days after the fall of Quarteng, to at least five conservative members of parliament openly calling for his res or her resignation, as well as the rest of the government, including Quarteng, who by that time had been removed. The same day, at Prime Minister's Questions, Liz Truss was nowhere to be seen. Instead, she had to meet with the 1922 committee, which sets the rules for whether a government is still allowed to function, and most importantly, sets the rules for conservative party leadership elections, and is usually responsible for telling prime ministers, previously candidates like Theresa May, or Boris Johnson, to resign, and this meeting was obviously significant. Just two days after that, Suella Braverman resigned on the 19th of October due to what she claimed were significant differences between her vision for the government and what the mandate Liz Truss had been elected by conservative members was against what Jeremy Hunt's new plan for the government was. And it was increasingly clear that Jeremy Hunt had most of the power, even more than Liz Truss, some say. This is because Jeremy Hunt got nearly his entire program passed whereas Liz Truss, of course, had her entire program just thrown away. This led to the vote on fracking, which was possibly the largest failure for Liz Truss. It was a labor motion that would ban fracking, not only communities that did not want it, but would also set severe restrictions on those who were okay with the fracking. Liz Truss's government, as well as Liz Truss herself, says that they are pro-fracking, or at least were pro-fracking, and many conservative members of parliament are against fracking. This is because they know that their constituents don't want fracking in their communities, and therefore they were going to vote against the government. However, Truss's government claimed that it was a vote of no confidence, which means that if you were to vote against the government, you would cease to be a conservative member of parliament I would instead be registered as an independent in the parliament, which is a huge deal, especially for members of parliament who saw their potentially careers vanishing into thin air if they opposed the government. This led to a lot of confusion among conservative members of parliament, with some even asking the secretary for environment of the conservative government if it was a vote of confidence, and they got no answer. So this led to a lot of confusion. There was bullying allegations from conservatives against other conservatives, and major whips were rumored to have resigned. This led to even more chaos when, while the government was able to narrowly uh, win the vote among conservative MPs, there was a significant portion of MPs who abstained on the motion, including both Boris Johnson and Theresa May. And kicking two prime ministers out of the party was something that Trust couldn't have just so soon into her tenure, which led to, by October 20th, the resignation of Liz Truss, leading to her being the shortest ever tenured prime minister. This was obviously a very, very important thing because it meant that the conservatives now had to rapidly arrange a leadership election. So, before anyone could organize a leadership election, Labour, the Lib Dems, the SP, the Greens, Pretty much every party from all over the political spectrum, except for the conservatives themselves, called an early general election. Polls right before and now just after Liz Truss resigned 
showed Labour at roughly 50% of the vote, with the Conservatives significantly behind at 20%, with the Lib Dems on 10%, with smaller parties like the SNP having 5%, and the Greens on 4 This was extremely significant, because it was the largest polling lead seen since 1997, or the late 1990s, when Tony Blair was able to absolutely steamroll the Conservatives with his new Labour platform. The format outlined by the 1922 committee was most significant because it said that the Conservatives would select their Prime Minister within just one week, and this would be a Prime Minister to mandate or cam candidates removed from the mandate. The mandate, of course, won by Boris Johnson back in 2019, who had a massive majority. So, here are the rules of the leadership election in short. There are 100 members of Parliament need to endorse you if you are to pass the first round instead of 30 like last time. There are only 357 conservative members of parliament, meaning that at most three candidates, likely two, would be able to make it past that first round. And we already see three main candidates, only one of them having officially launched their campaign. Penny Mordaunt is the most centrist candidate in this conservative leadership election, or at least centrist of the party. Penny has been the one to announce her campaign, but she's actually trailing the other two main candidates for this leadership election. She currently has somewhere between 20 and 50 endorsements. Nobody really knows because there are many anonymous endorsements, but generally Penny Moyant is seen as currently in third place. In first place, as he was expected to be, is Rishi Sunak. Sunak, of course, came second to trust in the last leadership election, and it was always expected that he was going to do well. Sunak has actually secured over 100 members of parliament endorsements already, which means that he will officially be on the final ballot. But perhaps most surprising, at least to those who don't have a knowledge of Boris Johnson or UK politics, is that Boris Johnson himself is running for a second stint as prime minister. A hugely important thing because Boris Johnson is now going to be competing with his other party members on the right wing of the party. And this includes people like Suella Braverman, who had of course resigned from government because she considered herself significantly more right wing than even Liz Truss. Suella is highly rumored to be launching a leadership campaign but it is almost impossible for her to get to 100 members of parliament if Boris Johnson is in the race. But perhaps more significant from Boris Johnson's perspective is that if Suella does indeed launch a leadership campaign, Boris Johnson may struggle to get to the 100 members of parliament, which could potentially result in Rishi Sunak being the only candidate on the final ballot. We also have the secretary from Northern Ireland, Brandon Lewis, but he is also extremely unlikely to make it to that second round because Penny Mordaunt and Rishi Sunak have mostly taken whatever support he may have had. So you could probably expect it to be a Boris first Rishi final matchup. And once again, this has a major, major, major effect on the country because most members of parliament prefer Rishi Sunak and the general public as a whole probably prefers Rishi Sunak as well albeit much more narrowly than the MPs. It, we also have to remember that many members of parliament who are conservatives previously resigned from Boris Johnson's government, and it is unlikely that they would be enthusiastic to come back, or even if they would come back at all. However, members clearly prefer Boris Johnson, with polls saying that Boris would win roughly 60% of the members' vote, as opposed to just 10 for Rishi Sunak. So, what will happen next? Well, it seems clear that one thing in particular will happen. We're likely going to have to see some arrangement by Rishi Sunak and Boris Johnson if they want to have even a sliver of a hope of victory at the next general election, probably in 2025. And this arrangement will likely have to be Boris Johnson backing out and endorsing Rishi Sunak. Why? Well, it's simple. Boris Johnson is incredibly unpopular with the public, while Sunak is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly disliked by conservatives. If Boris backs Rishi, 
and conservatives follow Boris into the pro-Rishi camp. This could significantly raise Rishi Sunak's poll numbers and lead to a major comeback potential victory in 2025 for conservatives. If, on the other hand, there is no compromise, we can almost certainly expect continued collapse of the conservatives in the polls, potentially even leading to the end of the conservative party. The end of the conservative party has been warned about mostly by moderates in the party, as well as those on the extremes. But none of the mostly, I guess, ideologically left-wing conservatives or right-wing conservatives like Boris Johnson or Rishi Sunak have openly said that the collapse of the conservative party is a possibility. Mostly it is members who are considering joining the Liberal Democrats on the left, or UKIP or the Brexit party on the right. But those in the center have a good point. If Boris and Rishi are unable to get together and figure out a way where one of them will govern, especially if that one person isn't Rishi Sunak and does end up being Boris Johnson, we can not only expect a massive landslide defeat for conservatives, but potentially a shrinking down to the second, from the second rather, to the third or even fourth party status in Parliament. The SNP is almost guaranteed to win roughly 50 seats due to having a major majority in Scotland while the Liberal Democrats can likely be assured to pick up many seats in southern England and southwestern London from the Conservatives. Labour will likely pick up most of the Red Wall as well as some of the areas in the Midlands. So, if the Conservatives are going to lose nearly everywhere, then we could potentially be seeing the last time the Conservatives win a general election as happened with the previous Liberal Party, now the Liberal Democrats, way back in the interwar years between World War I and World War II, and recently happened in Canada with the Progressive Conservatives back in the 2000s. So, what do you think will happen? Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe with your thoughts down below, and I will see you next time.